baby. This movie solidified my love of dinosaurs. While it's an old movie, it is still timeless. Jurassic Park. The movie starts off like a bad omen. It looks like we're watching E.T., but there's this big cargo and everybody's standing at attention. This cargo box is obviously carrying something very dangerous. The location all of this is happening, an island called Isla Nublar. The men can hear hissing and growling inside, but we can't see exactly what it is. This guy is running the show and telling people to be careful. Whatever it is, they're trying to load it in without anybody being killed. It's the reason why there's such amped up security here. The first thing you're thinking when you watch this movie is what the frick do they have in there? Freaking dragon? When the crate is lined up, they try to open up the gate so the animal can go inside. But the animal gets really mad and charges it, causing the poor worker to fall off as the crate falls backward. Before he can make a move, the creature is still inside the crate and grabs him. The man does the iconic I'm guessing they didn't shoot her? Or I have a theory about that, and I can't remember if I made a video about it or not. That theory is that creature is dead. The one we saw in the beginning was just too aggressive, and when they were shooting her, she actually died. Or these freaking creatures that they're making up on this island are made of freaking iron. Later, somewhere else, we meet a lawyer. He gets to the island and is talking to the workers there. They're working for a man named Hammond, and they find mosquitoes trapped in amber. The whole reason this lawyer is here in the first place is because of what happened with that dinosaur accident. They mention a man named Alan Grant, and then we meet him in the next scene. He digs up fossils. He is as rustic and cocky as they come. And you can't help but like him because he knows the shit even though everything or a lot of the stuff he says about dinosaurs or the specific species of dinosaurs at that time was wrong. That's his girlfriend Ellie Sattler who keeps pressuring him to have kids. They take a 3D x-ray thing of the dinosaur and he mentions that it's a velociraptor. He's all talking about how scary and dangerous and wonderful it is and then some kid has to say something from the back. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. That doesn't look very scary. More like a six foot turkey. Pardon me, ladies and gentlemen. My son Dylan's nanny is out of town. That's fine. Just listen to me. Yeah, well, good. Because I need you two right now. Then Al Grant schools him and is like, I'm gonna shove this up your ass. Real deep, you don't shut the fuck up. After scaring the kid, he feels pleased with himself that he's taught the kid a lesson. Mission accomplished. Then a helicopter comes over the dig site and threatens to undo all the work they just dug up. Some rich idiot is in their mobile home without their permission. They blast in, they're like, okay, who's the asshole? Turns out it's John Hammond, the man who owns a park filled with wonders. Ellie and Alan are enthralled with this man because they've heard of him. They're like, we can't leave our dig site. And he's like, I have something to show you far, far away. I'm Peter Pan, come with me and you may never return. And they know they can't because their life work is here. And he's like, how about if I offer you a really large check? Well, that's all they need. It doesn't take much for them to get onto the helicopter, helicopter. And now somewhere else we meet this obnoxious guy called Dennis Nedry who's making a deal with this man here named Doxit. Apparently he's supposed to steal some embryos and they're gonna pay him a lot of money and he has to hide it in this Barbasol can. Well along with Alan and his girlfriend Ellie they meet Ian Malcolm, the legend who keeps flirting with Ellie. Oh my god Alan he's so hot. Slut! So this whole helicopter ride is one big cock block. Ellie Sattler, Alan Grant meet for the first time Ian Malcolm and the unpleasant lawyer. Ian is definitely the star of the show here. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I will never get old. We can see that Hammond really does not like Dr. Malcolm, and he's not even the one who wanted him there. It was the lawyer. So he asked them about chaos theory and the law of attraction and all of that, and this is literally his... Look, look, I don't know why this was so hilarious, but just watching Alan Grant's face throughout the whole thing, dude is shooting his shot. Strange attractors. Dr. Sattler, I, I refuse to believe that you aren't familiar with the concept of attraction. It's <laughs> Mr. Still Your Girl. There's a majestic CGI shot of the helicopter or the toy model helicopter flying over the island. Hammond is excited. Around this time, everyone tries to put on their seatbelt. Alan Grant has two females and he tries to put them together. Everyone is trying to help him figure out how to put on a seatbelt. And then he's like, you know what? I'll find a way. I'll just tie them like this. It can't possibly be foreshadowing for anything else that's gonna happen in this movie. They see a Jeep pull up that says Jurassic Park. Everyone is kind of like, what the frick is happening right now? There's like freaking electric gates all over the place. Can't possibly be what my sidekick is saying or, or trying to tell us. The jeeps roll in, and Ellie is talking about how some of the stuff in the brochure are just about creatures or plants that were like 
millions of years old, or plants rather, because she's like the botanist, the paleobotanist, and then something catches Alan Grant's attention. hasn't seen what the hell he's talking about. She's still wrapped up in what she's doing and Alan is freaking out. What could he be looking at? What is so astounding that he can't take his eyes off of it? And Alan's the kind of person that's not easily impressed. What are they looking at? Everyone's already been on this ride, you know exactly what it is. For the rest of you who still not watched this freaking movie, I implore you to watch it because it's gonna be amazing when you first see this. Although, it might have been spoiled for you already. But anyways, let's continue. What has Ellie Sattler and Alan Grant's eyes looking like this? So it gives me chills every time I look at this movie. So, Mr. Hammond, Dr. Hammond is so pleased with himself. He's like, I told you, like my chicken. Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler, loving dinosaurs as much as they do, are crazy with excitement. And then Alan's like, you have a T-Rex? You have a T-Rex? You have a T-Rex? And then John Hammond's like, <laughs> you have a T-Rex. And then comes one of the most chilling moments in cinematic history. When after Dr. Hammond knows he has these guys on the hook, after he's seen the amazement, after he's seen them doubling over with childlike wonder. He says the one line that he will always be remembered for, even after he's been long gone. My dear Dr. Sattler, welcome to Jurassic Park. Damn. Damn, I guess I just... Sorry. Oh god, my belly. Oh, I love this movie so much. This movie is freaking lit. Oh. Then he's like, how did you do this? And John Hammond's like, I'll show you. They go to a facility where you can see actual fossils. He sits them down in front of some weird presentation where he talks to himself. And Mr. DNA tells him that the dinosaurs were brought about when a mosquito stuffed its needle inside their ass crack and pulled out their blood. And then the mosquito landed on some tree and got fossilized and whatever. I'm just like, I'm just thinking, how many mosquitoes did this? And how did they manage to find them? Because are you saying this one mosquito is what they use to generate everything? For what I know, they took this one mosquito that apparently doesn't suck blood to make all the dinosaurs and spliced it with frog DNA so he could clone them and make them all look like weird things. The mosquito that they showed in the movie is an elephant mosquito and it doesn't suck blood so it must have some very magical properties for them to have been able to take all the dinosaur DNA to kick off the cloning process. Maybe it's the mosquito's memories of the creatures. That would make more sense. Pulling all its hopes and dreams out of its ass. It'd take two years to look at the entire DNA strain. It's that long. Mr. Genie explains that there's lots of holes in it, so they use frog DNA to fill all that in. The dinosaurs that we're actually looking at are not technically dinosaurs. They're creatures that are made to look like them, and they say as much in Jurassic World. Here's where we first meet Dr. Wu, the geneticist, and the guy behind making all of this happen. They see a dinosaur hatch, and it's a velociraptor. Only it's not really a velociraptor. It's more of a Deinonychus. Because all the animals in Jurassic Park are female. We've engineered them that way. That means that sooky sooky can't happen. Unless, of course, you know, somehow it can. I've been present for the birth of every little creature on this island. <laughs> You're so sweet. Have you though? Have you really? Because I would figure if they're trial and erroring these creatures and you know not all of them are going to come out the way they want, you must not have anything else to do. Do they call you in the middle of the night when the eggs are ready to hatch and you have to get up at three o'clock in the morning to go see them hatch? I think this is just a sales pitch here. I don't think that's real. I think even Alan knows this. He and Malcolm steps in while everyone's all googly eyed and sparkly eyed and he's like, listen, the, the, the type of control that you're attempting here, it's not possible. And this is where he says his iconic line, that no matter how many of JJ's you try to scissor, you'd think they can't figure out how to have kids. But I'm sure some of those dinosaurs over time will have big clatances. And having ultimate control over species that you have no idea about is ludicrous. Something the history of evolution has taught us is that life will not be contained. Life 
breaks free. Again. Dr. Hammond is like, what? who brought this man? I just want people to be freaking happy. And what I'm doing, you're ruining everything. Huh? So Dr. Wu jumps in and he's like, are you trying to say that a group of animals comprised totally out of females are going to be able to breed? Because, dude, that's the case. You need to start sipping some of that coffee and wake your brain up because clearly you're not thinking well. I know everything. I've been doing this for a long time. I'm the Mr. Mad Scientist. Who are you, Rockstar? How many coochies did you see kiss and pop out a child? No, I'm, I'm simply saying that life uh, finds a way. After they move on and see the raptors rip apart a bull, we're introduced to possibly the most dangerous and intelligent creatures that they've created. This is where we meet Muldoon, the man that we saw in the beginning of the movie that was trying to save that other guy from being eaten, and uh, he was unsuccessful. After John Hammond has shown them everything, he's excited, and he's like, you guys, you guys, this is amazing. I used to do flea circuses, and now this thing, and I have dinosaurs. Isn't this amazing? And they're like, yeah, it's amazing, but uh, yeah, it's not really a good idea. The Lord likes it of course but John Hammond is very upset because for the most part Ellie and Alan the experts that he brought to the island to give the go-ahead that it was safe don't have that much faith in it being totally controllable yeah yeah but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could they didn't stop to think if they should there it is that is always the case with everything but this doesn't stop anyone from doing what this is like the navel before the belly, the toe before the foot. Look, what I'm trying to say is, this is the calm before the storm. There you go. Of course, nobody wants to hear that their dream that they poured their love and guts into and shit is not really appreciated. Even though these guys do appreciate what he's done, they're being honest and saying that it's probably not a good idea to bring freaking meat-eating dinosaurs back to life that you hardly know anything about. Ellie tries to break it a little gently and saying, how can you presume to know anything about an extinct ecosystem? And so how can you attempt to even know what to do to control it? Which is a very fair question. Alan says, how do we know what to expect when we have a creature and us that were separated by 65 million years of evolution just thrown back into the mix together? You're meant to come down here and defend me against these characters and the only one I've got on my side is the blood-sucking lawyer. Thanks, John. The dinner's interrupted when someone tells John Hammond his kids are here. Sorry, his grandkids. Um, this is when kids are introduced to the franchise. Unkillable little things that they are. Alan does not look too pleased. He does not like kids. While they're all going on a tour, Ian Malcolm is like, I'm gonna go with uh, Dr. Sattler. You know, old Western man, maybe you should probably tell that guy that she's your girlfriend. He's about to go and break that up when he's interrupted by this kid, just staring at him like a freaking creep. He follows Alan Grant around, much to Ellie's delight, and tells him that he loves him so much and he knows so much about him and he wants to hug him and hear his heart beat from his stomach. And Alan is trying his damnedest to get away from this kid but the kid wants to go wherever he's going you see this is usually what happens to me except that i'm really good with kids and then i go like get all excited and i'm like yeah let's pretend that we're on ponies and shit and then when i'm tired i've already amped the kid up so much to enjoy being with me that i can't get rid of them so nowadays i just try to stay away because i know that's gonna happen then their parents are gonna be asking to babysit and all that crap because i get along with them so well and ellie sattler is so freaking mean to him after he gets rid of timmy the other child lex says that ellie told her to ride with him must be Look at that cute face. <laughs> we can already tell since these two are a couple and she absolutely wants kids and he absolutely does not. They're probably not going to work out long term. When I saw this movie, this is the first time I've ever seen Samuel Jackson. When they go on the tour, they don't see any dinosaurs. They hear stuff about him. And as the automatic vehicles go along the trail, the group is a little bit disappointed that they didn't get to see anything. When they stop by the T-Rex paddock, they try to tempt it by giving it a goat. Uh, now, now eventually you do plan to have dinosaurs on your on your dinosaur tour, right? I really hate that man. I feel so bad for Johnny. <laughs> As Ian Malcolm is flirting with Ellie, Alan Grant gets out of the car. While Ian is flirting with Ellie, telling her about chaos theory. Look at that freaking freaking womanizer. Ellie's loving it too. She's like, oh my God, he's like staring at me. Alan who? Everybody decides to follow Alan outside because he heard something. It's a triceratops and sick. Ellie Sattler is so excited. Everyone's excited because this is actually the first time they've gotten to touch a dinosaur. Platonic though, unless it wants, I don't know. She tries to figure out what's wrong with it. And Alan lies on top of its stomach. The poor thing is having problems breathing and he's there sitting on it. Now apparently there's a storm coming through and they're gonna have to cut the tour short. Much to John Hammond's displeasure. I don't know what about this scene like Ian Malcolm is just doing the sexiest like 
Rockstar walk ever, just to say. That is one big pile of shit. Comedic timing without even actually trying to be funny. That's what I love about this film. Ellie digs through it to try and find the cause of the Triceratops sickness. When we cut back to inside the facility, we see that Nedry's up to something. Remember, we saw Nedry at the beginning of the movie taking a deal with this other guy called Dogson to steal embryos. Now I know what the embryos are that he's supposed to be stealing from the park. He tells us guys that I'll be by the dock soon. And the people at the dock are like, hurry, we can't wait here all time because there is a storm that's coming in. You're gonna have to hurry it up. Nedry makes an excuse and leaves. Well, not really. According to everyone else, he's going to the vending machine. He trips the security and basically deactivates the park security system so that he can get the embryos and nobody can know. He did try to play this off by saying that some of the security stuff would go offline as he was debugging something or whatever the excuses he gave them. He takes out some of the embryos and starts to conceal them in the can. Isn't Tyrannosaurus spelled with two N's? Isn't Stegosaurus spelled with an O? Not an A. Are these the best people to be working with dinosaurs? Come on, get it together. You're a dinosaur park. You need to at least know how to spell the freaking things. And Nedry's out of there. When Nedry's taking a little longer than normal and they notice that the security stuff is off, they also notice that the fences to the dinosaurs are off as well. This means that if a dinosaur decides he wants to jump through the fence, he's jumping through the fence because nothing's gonna shock him back in place. The dinosaurs that they are most worried about are the velociraptors. Those fences are still on. So then Hamma is like, what the frick is going on? Why would he turn the other ones off and not turn those off? Why the hell would he turn the other ones off? Unfortunately, when Nedry's trying to make his getaway, he gets turned around and he doesn't know which way is east. Mr. Arnold, aka Samuel Jackson, tries to work out how to get the systems back online. Now this is halfway through the adventure and things start to seem ominous. The goat is there. When Temmie puts on his night goggles that he found, he quickly discovers in an instant, the goat is not. Do you know how terrifying that is? Freaking A, man. When I first saw that, I was like, God damn it. It's like the big buildup because they hit all the dinosaurs and now you're going to see them for the first time. Yes. They look up and for the first time, they see the Tyrannosaurus Rex. The Tyrannosaurus Rex is smart enough to know now that she can touch the wires. Ah, the 10,000 volts are non-existent. Here we can see her swallowing the goat. Hey, humans. The lawyer freaks out and he's like, I'm out of this bitch. Lex, the sister of Timmy, is like, you left us here alone. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, if anything, he probably saved your lives because if the T-Rex is looking at you, he saw that guy run into that little bathroom command thing. So he left you so he could be a distraction. I'm sure that's not the reason the character did it. I'm sure it's because he was a coward. But still, it's not exactly a bad thing. He shuts himself in the bathroom and freaks out. The T-Rex quickly breaks out. <laughs> Even though Alan is freaked out and scared, he's still in awe because this is the first time he's seeing a live T-Rex. And all he says is, it's vision is based on movement, keep absolutely still. And I'm wondering to myself, like, how would you freaking know that? I mean, these creatures, you even said, are not like the regular creatures. You don't know anything about them. And these creatures have freaking frog DNA, like sliced inside their gametes or, or, or stems, whatever. How would you possibly know that even if a real T-Rex would see a vision based on movement, that this T-Rex would? Then for some stupid ass reason, this bitch is like, let me go inside the, the freaking box and take out the biggest mother freaking flashlight you ever saw, the thing that they use in like Nautilus movies where you go down to the depths and you want to make it look like daylight in the middle of the goddamn deep ocean. And let me turn it the fuck on. Let me turn it on and point it at the T-Rex. For what reason uh, was that necessary? Every time I watch this movie, I keep wondering to myself, what was the everlasting point in her doing that? My blood pressure is going up, which is healthy for me because I have low blood pressure. But still, what is the bitch ass reason for you to fucking do this? I'm sorry, it's so annoying. It makes no sense from a writing perspective. It makes no sense. I mean, she's probably the character people wrote to showcase what a dumb blonde is because good grief. Even her little brother's like, turn the light off. The T-Rex starts sniffing around the car because now you know you've gotten its attention. She still has the light on. She still has the light on. The T-Rex can see them moving around in there because the light is on and you're wiggling it around, you stupid c- Gotcha, bitch. This is terrifying, but this must also be some very powerful ass glass. Then the T-Rex is like, okay, you're screaming. You're shining this light in my eye. I think you guys are asking me to be eaten and I'm going to oblige. So let me turn 
over the car to try and get you guys out of there. Ellen and Ian are freaking out because they're like, damn, the kids are gonna get eaten. We can't let that happen because they're stupid ass kids. I mean, this is natural selection network. This is the fittest survive and clearly those kids are not equipped to stay alive. The T-Rex is having fun trying to kill because it's never hunted before and all of its life in captivity here. So it's like, mm, let me taste down on this, this nice rubbery wheel here. It's void of any blood, but tastes like, like, like dinosaur rubber. Yes! With the T-Rex standing on the SUV, the kids are being squished underneath the car or sunk into the mud. Then Alan gets a flare to try and save the kids. Now you're putting other people's lives in danger, you stupid freaking fish mouth woman. Alan's like, hey, the T-Rex sees him and roars very loudly. And this is where things start to get very crazy, so. Hold on to your butts. Ian Malcolm comes out too, but he doesn't get the concept of staying still and letting it chase the flare. The T-Rex pushes him into the freaking cabana. The lawyer's on the toilet. The lawyer gets eaten. Alan tries to help the kids. Stupid ice cube tits here screams when she sees the T-Rex and just stands there like that's the, this this one this this stupid person. Please spare me the oh she's a child. Most kids are smart. Most kids are the best people when it comes to surviving because they know how to hide and shut the hell up. She has some horrible genes, zero IQ when it comes to survival. She's the kind of person that would have been eaten at birth. The tears is like, what the frick was that annoying sound? Apparently it can't see them because they're staying still. Timmy is still in the car and they decide that they're gonna have to hold on to the wires that the T-Rex ripped apart to go down to the T-Rex paddock. If you're wondering how the T-Rex was able to walk out of its paddock on level ground and there's a steep drop here, I believe the only thing that could explain this is that the T-Rex paddock or at least this part of it is in a valley area. And off screen, there's an incline that goes back up to level ground. So most of the time, the T-Rex is probably spending its time deep down, down this incline or slope into the jungle down below. Lex goes on Alan Grant's back. Meanwhile, the T-Rex is pushing the car over the edge. Timmy is still in the car. It lands in a tree. Roar, I pushed a car. Back at the facility, they try to figure out what was going on with Nedry, who was not back, by the way. Dr. Arnold here, who is an expert at talking while a cigarette is in his mouth. I don't even know how he's doing that. Whether or not he had to practice for this role, I don't know. For something that he does, how does he do that? Who knows? But he tells him that Nedry does some weird programming stuff. Partner would probably understand this more than I do, or the drift's probably talking out their asses. But he didn't want people to see what he was about to do. There's about two million lines of code, and they would have to go through each one one by one to see what was going on. Or to get the white rabbit object that, look, who cares? The point is, Nedry tried to hide his tracks and he didn't want people to see what he was doing. Now they're probably gonna have to shut down the whole system, just restart everything. Dr. Hammond is like, oh my God, I, uh, my grandchildren are out there. Muldoon, please, please, can you save them? Ellie Sattler goes with him. I can't get Jurassic Park back online without Dennis Nedry. Guess what happens to Dennis Nedry? His car goes in a ditch. He falls down a waterfall. While trying to get himself out, he meets a Dilophosaurus. The thing that spits venom into people's eyes is apparently mad at him because he doesn't want to play fetch. He almost gets blinded and loses the Barbasol can that's going to cost him not only his job from that, but the money that they were supposed to give him for those embryos. He gets back in his Jeep and there's the dinosaur waiting for him. Yum, yum, bitch. He dies or the dinosaur rapes him. I don't really know what's going on. I mean, the, the Jeep is, you know. But it's cool because in the Telltale Jurassic Park game, or at least one of the Jurassic Park games I played, when they go and find Nedry's Jeep, you can see that he's been eaten by the creature. Like there's a corpse of him there. So there's, there's, there's confirmation that the guy's dead. When Alan and Lex get down to the bottom, they see that Tim is still in the tree, but it's okay. Tim is fine. Of course he is. He's a child in a Jurassic Park franchise. And oh boy, as they're trying to climb down the tree and Timmy's freaking out, guess what happens? Oh no, the car starts to move because the wheel is slipping and all that jazz. And I don't know what's going on here, but instead of moving sideways out of the way or on the other side of the tree, they all try to race the vehicle down the tree. I'm sorry. Are, are you guys not aware that, you know, since the car is creaking, that you could jump to other branches? Are you not aware that you can climb that way? Or I don't know, climb that way? Like what the stupid ass squirrels do when they're trying to not let you see them. They, they, they go from one side of the telephone pole to the other so they can hide and you can't see them and whatnot. Did nobody with all of their freaking intelligence think about that? I swear to goodness, man. Look at this tree. It's not like there weren't other branches that they could they could go onto. There were other branches that you could have gone onto. Just, just check this out. Like you, you could have swung over on the other side and, and, and caught another branch on either side of the freaking tree. Like you, you don't have to, you didn't, 
Jesus. They safely get down to the bottom and end up in the car again. I wonder if that's a real car that fell on them and they had to take a risk of being crushed by it in the scene. Sattler and Muldoon come back and they find pieces of the lawyer all over the place where the T-Rex chow down on. They also hear Ian Malcolm, who was badly hurt. They look over the wall and see that the car went down there. Ellie is beside herself crying for Alan. I like how she doesn't care about the kids. She's just like, Alan. And I can't blame her. She doesn't know those kids. He's not in there and she sees the tracks, meaning they escaped. Ian Malcolm, I think he's given some care or morphine or something, but he hears something. He sees ripples in the water. Oh no, whatever could that be? He tells Ellie and Muldoon to hurry up and come back. And that's when we see the T-Rex behind them like, hey bitches. The T-Rex is catching up to them. Oh no. Well, then they floor it and get away. Seriously, if you haven't seen that chase, you should definitely watch the movie and see it for yourselves. Good great grief. At one point, the dinosaur's head like strokes across everybody in the freaking van and they feel it. Alan is with the kids because you know, he doesn't like kids and by the end of the movie, he's going to like kids now. He spends the night with Lex and Timmy and they see the Brachiosaurus is up close. Alan makes a calling noise and the dinosaurs respond in kind. Shh, shh, don't the monsters come over here? I like how the one, I like how the one Brachiosaurus is like, who in the fuck? Shut the hell up. Some of us are trying to sleep and Blockbuster and chill down here. Baby, come back to bed. I was almost there. Hammond is so scared because he doesn't know what happened to his grandchildren. And he tells Ellie Sattler of his dream of when he had his little flea circus and it was an illusion. And he wanted something that was real, something that was magical that he can give the people and that everybody could have access to no matter whether they were rich or poor. Ellie says that's great and all, but you know, you didn't have the respect for the fact that you were messing with freaking dinosaurs. And uh, yeah, now this is bound to happen. I think they both connected in this area right here, eating all the ice cream before it was melting because they both have something to lose now. Ellie has Alan, who she's really worried about. And John Hammond has his grandkids out there who he's worried about and they're together, which means if something happens to either of them, it could happen to all of them. Brachiosaurus decides to eat the leaves right by where Alan is sleeping. Mmm, these leaves taste extra fresh. Got them here human juices all over it and shit. Go away! Bitch, who was you talking to? You in my tree! Now that it's morning time, the others have to try and get back to the facility and they see some eggs on the ground. And eggs means, oh no, these eggs are not in the lab, but dinosaurs have been shebanging. I guess those brachiosaurs really were blockbustering and chilling. What the frick is a blockbuster? Alan explains to the kids, yeah, they used frog DNA or amphibian DNA to fill in the gaps for the genetic code. And some West African frogs were known to change their innies to outies when there was only an innie environment, if you know what I mean. As the gorgeous painting of Ian Malcolm said, life finds a way. Back at the facility, since the others cannot reactivate the security system, Chief Engineer Ray Arnold decides to reboot the park system, cause tis the only way. All we have to do is turn them back on, reboot a few systems in here, telephones. So he says it's ready and all I have to do is go and, you know, do something manually. Let's all go to some emergency bunker while Arnold will go to the maintenance shed to complete the rebooting process manually. I wonder what could ever happen. Meanwhile, Alan Grant and the kids get to see the dinosaurs in all their glory. <laughs> Sorry, I'm choking on myself. Hammond and the group, they get to the bunker. Ellie and Muldoon decide to head out because, well, Ray is taking a long time to come back. Hammond says he will guide them. So they go out with the headset. And this is the scariest part of the entire movie because you see them creatures that are very dangerous, the most dangerous one, the most intelligent ones, the Velociraptors, are now free. They did say earlier in the movie that the Velociraptors would check for weaknesses in the fence. The Velociraptors probably noticed that something was off and they checked that fence all right. Yeah, so now you got these demon gargoyle-like dinosaurs roaming free. So Muldoon's like, yeah, I guess when this thing shut down, it turned off all the fences. Even Nedry knew not to mess with those things. Everybody, even if you didn't know anything about dinosaurs, knew that the raptors were freaking devil incarnates. This is when Muldoon realizes that he and Ellie are being hunted. And he's like, you know what, just go to the shed. I got her. I I'm good. Ellie runs her ass off. I mean, she really, really Tomb Raiders that shit. She gets to the shed safely. Meanwhile, John and Ian are helping her out. Alan, Tim, and Lex are still trying to find a way back. They see a fence. The lights are off, so that means that the fence is off. Alan tests it and jokes around with the kids. I want you to notice, when he grabs it, you can see the scale of how big the fence is versus how big he is. 
correct? I mean, technically, if he wanted to, he could squeeze through that. But let's just say they're not small enough because there are some points, you know, further up on the fence that look a little bit small. Maybe he can't fit in there or he'd really have trouble doing so. But you know who could fit through there? Lex and Tim. They can both fit through the holes. If you don't believe me, look at the width of her shoulders, which is all you need. This is the widest part on our bodies our shoulders, and sometimes our hips. But usually the shoulders, if you can get your shoulders through, you can get the rest of your body through. Timmy as well. Look at the size of the holes. Look at them. This is where I am sure the whole people being perpetually stupid in this franchise came from. Because good grief, did it not occur to you as an actual kid, like all of us have done as little kids, to squeeze through something. Uh, you can squeeze through it. But no, subverting expectations. Like, look at this shit. Timmy can squeeze straight through there, so can you, Lex? What is the matter with you people? Now there's supposed to be some fake build up tension because Hammond is trying to tell Ellie, you got to turn on the stuff, and they're fighting against a time when they're gonna turn back on the electricity to the fences as well. As Ellie is doing all of that, Lex and Alan make it over the other side. And for some reason, Timmy does it. Oh, he's scared of heights. Then bitch, go through the holes. Like he looks so stupid because he's literally holding himself. Oh, oh my God. Alan tells him, look, those lights, the security lights just came back off. This fence is gonna turn on any minute. Just jump, I'll catch you. And Timmy's like, I'm not gonna jump. Like he's the weirdest kid ever. Like every other kid would be like, all right, catch me, dude. I've been waiting for this my whole life. Ellie starts going down the list, building up suspense. And guess which fence they're at? The very last one on the list. Timmy gets shot, he goes down anyway. I don't know if it's just me, but does getting shocked by electricity cause you to fly like 16 feet back? I thought when you get shocked, your body just goes limp and falls straight down. Maybe there's something I'm missing. They have to resuscitate Timmy because he's not breathing, but he's fine. Unfortunately, Ellie is not. Mr. Hammond, I think we're back in business. <laughs> I must say, I love Laura Dern because she is a great actress. When she's terrified, yo, you believe it. <laughs> anyway, she locks the raptor out and then Arnold's hand goes on her shoulder and she's like, oh, Arnold, I, I, I thought that, you know, I'm so glad that you're here. She probably figured that, man, you got, you got chased by those things too and locked yourself in here. Good to know you're okay. Okay, now let's get out of here. But as hand is not attached to his body his arm just hanging there like its own neck and she's like what the fuck <gasps> the raptor takes the gate apart ellie runs for her life and she is never going to live this down like she is she's never gonna forget this day muldoon is still concentrating on the raptors ahead of me and you know the first time seeing this i'm wondering hmm does he not know anything about raptors did alan grant do a presentation to that little kid to scare him about the raptor being in front of you and the other two raptors come from the sides and kill you the other two raptors you didn't even know were there the raptor clearly knows that muldoon is there and muldoon doesn't think that this is odd knowing how intelligent these creatures are <sighs> Tim is okay, and they make it to like this this kitchen sort of area, the visitor center, which pops up later in the later movies. They eat some jello, and Alan's like, I'm gonna get help and see if I can raise the others. This looks so good. I haven't had pastry like this in a long time. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, man. This is not fair. You know what? It's Thanksgiving. I deserve this. I'm gonna be back. I'm gonna go get some cake. finally is reunited with Alan and so happy he's alive. Lex and Timmy are enjoying themselves. Lex thought she lost her brother back there and she did for a moment. Then she freezes and her jello starts shaking. They see a raptor silhouetted or its shadow against the actual drawing of itself. The next thing ensues is the children trying to fight the raptors or escape them in the kitchen. This is when they discover that the raptors can open doors. The kids escape the raptors. Timmy limps into a freezer and locks one of them in there. Now terrifying it is when you're trying to run away from something and you can't move? Have you ever had those dreams when you're trying to run and your legs feel like they're in water or lead? The raptor tries to come out of the freezer and Lex helps him close and lock it. There's still more. Alan and Ellie get back with the kids. The raptor sees them in the control room. And since the stupid girl Lex happens to be a hacker or something like that, she's like, I can get it back online. Cause you know, that's totally plausible. Really speaks to the security of this place, doesn't it? If a kitty hacker could just, you know, do whatever. We're not even gonna get there. Ellie is trying to help Alan hold the door 
door. Lex is trying to hack the system to get everything back online or to do whatever it is that she's trying to do. Timmy is doing fuck all. I'm telling you, the, the uselessness in this movie is just astounding. Alan tells John Hammond, look, bro, I got your grandkids. Get us the hell out of here. It's like, really? All the mainland. Tell them to send the damn helicopters. Why do you say that so sexy like, like, what are you doing, Sam Neil? You know damn well what you're doing. We're not in a Western here. You're not gonna take off your shirt, look all sweaty and ride a horse into the sunset. Is that what they did in Westerns? I don't know, every Western cowboy had that, that, that weird James Bond error about them. I'm gonna come through the glass! No! That's so sad. But what are they talking about? Come through what glass? I'm sorry, um, am I missing something? Cause, like, can you see the dinosaur's head? So, let me get this straight. This is the glass that's like this, this, that, this. The dinosaur's head is as big as this freaking opening. Its hips are much bigger, and its stomach is bigger and wider. How in the hell? Did the raptors manage to come to the glass? Did they turn into their liquid form first? I was really weird about that, but then I had to go back and look it over because I'm like, I must be missing something. And surely enough, I was. If you go back to when they just go inside the control room, you can see that there are other glass windows or openings right here. I'm guessing since the raptors can open doors and they have full access and there's not another door they open to get in there, the raptors can easily get through those glass things. And there's lots of those glass windows. There there, you can see them running past it. And that begs the question, why was the raptor by the door? Probably because the raptor knew that to get inside easily, it would have to open the door. They probably didn't really understand the concept of glass and they're like, you know what? Let me try banging my head through this and maybe I can get through. And they figured it out and they got through. They have no recourse, the humans, but to go up into the vents. They kick the ladder down so the raptors can't go up. Like that's really gonna affect things. I do like this iconic scene as you can see the Gattaca formation of the genes and stuff on the raptor's face which is funny because that's what it's made up of and it's just very ironic. Not ironic, but it's poetic, whatever. I don't know the word I'm trying to use. It really doesn't matter, it just looks cool. They end up going to the top of the visitor center and they have to ride the fossils of the dinosaurs. The raptors are like, hey, we can do that too. Then the other raptor comes in. Remember the third one is locked in the freezer. I do videos about what happened to those. Look at that thing, how cute it is. Oh my, we're gonna eat you, so yummy. Ouch. Rexy comes in and saves the day, but she just happened to sneak up on them and the raptors just didn't see her because they were so focused on what they were doing. She kills that raptor and the other one's like, bitch, what are you doing? Hammond gets there with the Jeep and he's like, come on. After Hammond drives off with the others and they try to book it off of the island to go to the helicopter, Rexy flings the other raptor and She's like, get the hell off of me. You do not know who you're messing with. And does that beautiful, iconic roar that ends out the movie. So many lives have been lost. And John Hammond is sorry to see it all go. This was his dream and I felt really bad for him. He just wanted to take something wonderful and give it to the rest of the world. And probably, based on the Michael Crichton books, wanted to take all the glory for himself and just be recognized as having done it. But they make him more of a sweet person in the movie. Ellie's like, oh, look how you're snuggling up to those kids. Oh, huh, that's funny. <laughs> Just because I'm nice to them doesn't mean I want a melon. We see pelicans flying as the movie closed out to basically tell us, hey, remember these birds that are flying around that can swallow cats whole and stuff? Yeah, they're like dinosaurs. They're basically modern day dinosaurs. The end. This movie is a favorite of mine. Of course, I think that the second Jurassic Park, the Lost World Jurassic Park is my favorite out of all of the movies with the exception of the first one because I think the first one is in the class all by itself. It did the right measures of suspense horror thriller i mean this was great this sci-fi horror was actually one of the best ones done that i've watched and this is an old movie i'm talking about since all the movies that we've had up until 2021 and with all the new technology we have and new methods of filming and whatnot i feel like this still holds up and is so much better and easily outclasses a lot of modern day films that have more new style graphics anyway thanks so much for watching this has been ultiori you ask we answer